Hello, Kelly, and welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me, Melissa. Kelly, you have a business after my own heart. You're in Champaign-Urbana, my old stomping grounds. I grew up in the backyard in Gibson City. And you own a business and operate the business. It's called Soul Care, S-O-U-L Care. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so um, Soul Care is really a place where people can find resources so that they can learn more about building a, a, a loving relationship with the divine and leaning into their authentic selves. It's also a place for people to find rest because um, we're all just kind of overworked and busy and burnt out and Um, I wanted to provide a dedicated space for people to find and experience what true rest and quiet is like. And then finally, it's a um, it's a place and a magnet to build community uh, for people who are interested in spiritual wellness and self-care and just are curious and want to have kind of deep conversations about who we are and what we believe in. So if. I'm in the middle of a work day and I have some time I can take 30, 45 minutes and just drop in. And what can I experience? Yeah. So it's funny. um, I intentionally put soul care in the middle of our community. So we're actually in the um, kind of the, the downtown Urbana area. We're actually on the second floor of a bank, believe it or not, um, because I wanted to provide a space that was literally in people's um, where they work and where they live, where they could have this drop-in experience of what a retreat would be like. And a lot of us feel like we need to go away out into the country overnight to get the benefits of going on retreat. But um, you can actually come into Soul Care for an hour before work, after work. Um, Some of us take like mental health days or, um, you know, you drop your kids off at daycare and people can come in and I have these lovely quiet pods mm-hmm. and they're spaces that are kind of about the size of a walk-in closet and people can reserve those spaces for just $10 an hour. Um, and it's a cell phone free zone and you can sit in the quiet pod. There's a, a lovely little like undyed muslin curtain um, to give you privacy and a comfy and um, firm couch. And you can sit and you can pray or meditate. You can journal. You can think uh, big thoughts. You can pray. I'm I'm sorry. You can color or or be artistic. You can read um, or you can take a nap. Mm. (laughs) <laughs> doesn't that sound delicious oh my goodness yeah i'm imagining the space in my mind and it just sounds like a little bit of heaven in the middle of a day that's just go 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 or so stressful to have you know 30 minutes in a place like you described could totally turn the day back around it could recharge your soul Yeah, absolutely. And we're so conditioned to like, even when we have a little bit of a downtime to fill it up with our phones or fill it up with, um, you know, for at home, we're going to do chores or we're going to watch Netflix or we're going to, you know, fill the time and the space up. And not that those things aren't bad, but they're also not always life-giving. Yeah, our soul craves those moments of stillness Mm -hmm. and it's an easy craving for us to overlook for sure Mm -hmm. yeah and that's where we can hear like what we truly want Mm -hmm. and also where we can hear those little nudges that we get from the divine or the universe or or whatever we choose to call that now you also mentioned that soul care is a place where you can have intriguing conversations, challenging conversations, open conversations. Do those run on a schedule? Can you just drop in and see if someone's there or how does that work? 
Yeah, so um, I'm always here. And so I have a, um, a place on our website where you can schedule a tour and come in and have a chat. So um, I always have some hot water on for tea and sit down on our big comfy couch and, and just have like real conversations. We do um, events and programs. So like, for example, this weekend, we have a um, a yoga class that's happening on Saturday or on Sunday. And we have an intro to breath work um, class that's happening on Saturday. Um, every Friday morning, I do, um, I teach contemplative prayer practices. Mm. So you can come in and learn um, some different ways to kind of pray and connect with God without words. And then you can experience a quiet pod. Um, yeah, so those are all different ways to come in and experience soul care. Wow, that just sounds so life-giving. Mm -hmm. Now, what was your inspiration to create soul care? Hmm. So, um, you know, I, I, the short story is that I was um, going through midlife crisis and I was kind of casting around for how I could um, really use all my gifts and talents and how they would all show up in one way. So I didn't have to um, kind of deny parts of myself or segment parts of my life. Um, and I was actually listening to a podcast and out of um, the Twin Cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul. And there was a woman that was interviewed on the podcast that had a retreat center in her home uh, in St. Paul, and it sounded delightful. She did a lot more um, kind of scheduled retreats and things like that. Um, and I gave her a call, actually, out of the blue. I looked her up. I looked up her con contact information. I gave her a call and kind of just had a conversation with her. Um, you know, what was that experience like? What inspired her? What did she like about it? What did she not like about it? And there was definitely a stirring within me that maybe this was something that I was invited to do in my own area. Um, I really sat with that for quite a long time, though, because um, as a woman um, who is raised and identified as being Catholic. Um, and as, you know, I have a lot of degree in education, but I don't have like a D, I, I don't have a, a master's degree in divinity or I haven't gone to school for theology. Um, and I didn't feel like, I didn't feel worthy mm -hmm. to be able to do this kind of work. Um, and I didn't really know what it would look like. And so after a lot of soul searching and talking, you know, discernment, um, I found myself on a four day silent retreat that I, I took myself on. And um, I actually had a pretty clear message from, from God that said, this is the work that I want you to do. Um, I, I have this really uh, story about seeing these squirrels that were um, going around in the glade where my um, hermitage cabin was and they were going around to all these different um, bushes and trees and like picking up seeds there and planting acorns here and um, I realized that they were actually responsible for the growth and development and diversity of this glade and that's what God was asking me to do. He was asking me to be the squirrel and inviting me to be this linchpin and this special space and place that would really reflect the diversity of our community and that I didn't need to have any special, um, anything else more than what I currently had to do it. That's a beautiful story. There are so many things we can talk ourselves out of thinking we are not qualified. <laughs> or worthy. Yeah. <laughs> but I love how that 
that experience of watching the squirrels with the acorns, how that changed everything for you, because Mm -hmm. it's just the little things we're called to do one part of the story, not necessarily the whole thing. And I love, I love that image. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's okay. I don't view myself as being kind of an expert on anything, but I am um, a little bit further down the path than a lot of other people. And so um, I do kind of see myself as a torchbearer and as, um, you know, a, a leader on the trail, but not somebody who knows everything or needs to know everything or anything really. I can just be who I am. Well, I tell you, I would rather, much rather work with someone who saw themselves as a torchbearer than someone who thought they knew all of the answers, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Now, how many different faiths? Do you have to be a particular faith to uh, reap the benefits of soul care? No, we're actually, um, we're called, we're an interfaith center. Um, So we actually are open to people of all faiths, any faith, and no faith at all. So um, you don't have to, you don't have to even believe in God if you don't want to, to come into the center. Um, I was talking with a friend today and she said, oh, it's a faith fluid center. (laughs) Oh, goodness. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So I like to think of myself, um, of course, I mean, I am, I am a person of faith. I'm, I um, was raised and identify as being Catholic, although I always say that not, maybe not everybody would label me as Catholic because I have a pretty broad and progressive, um, view of my own spirituality but um you know we we talk with everybody who identifies as being wiccan to people who identify as being anabaptist um and and everything in between so um yeah i love that Mm -hmm. now you've had some pretty big obstacles and setbacks and spiritual dilemmas in your life yeah yeah (laughs) <laughs> so the episode, well, not the episode, the podcast is called Pursuing Uncomfortable because we share stories of people who have overcome really difficult things and can inspire others. Would you be willing to share your story with us of your yeah. husband's cancer? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I I kind of joke and say that I um, am currently on life 3.0. Um, although it might be even more than that at this point, but, um, you know, I, life 1.0, I was kind of going happily around. I, I went to college. I went to grad school. I met my husband. We, um, you know, we were together for five years before we had our children. Um, I had two point, I had two kids. We lived in a nice house. We both worked. We were kind of upperly mobile. And uh, he started having having some um, issues. He was having balance issues and um, choking. And he, you know, he went to the doctor, and they misdiagnosed him as having inner ear issue issues. And I was away at a friend's wedding in Canada, of all places, and he ended up going to the emergency room. And while he was at the emergency room. They found out that he had a mass in his brain and had to do brain surgery. And after running back from Canada uh, and being there in time for his surgery, we kind of soon discovered that he had brain cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, And we were in our early 30s. We had two young, you know, a a young kid under one. And um, my daughter was three or four. And I was working full time and he was working full time. And so we had to deal with him having a, um, a brain tumor and it was a, um, pretty much the kind that he was diagnosed with, which was glioblastoma was, um, as a terminal diagnosis, it's just a question of how long you're going to live with it. And it can be anywhere from a year to 20 years, Mm -hmm. but, um, 
unfortunately, he was the shorter kind, and we really struggled with that for about nine months. Um, and he was in the hospital or in a rehab center for about half of those nine months before he eventually succumbed and he passed away. So um, he died and I was left with like a one and a half year old and a four year old um, and kind of it, it, it really changed. I mean, literally changed my life um, going through that experience. Um, there was a lot of learning lessons through that experience, um, but I also really powered through it in a lot of ways. Um, but it, it, it literally changed my life. Yeah, that's not supposed to happen. And it's especially absolutely not supposed not. to happen when you're 30. No, absolutely not. And I mean, one of the side effects was that um, many of my friends who were in their late 20s and early 30s, some of whom had families, some of who didn't, um, it was really hard for them too, because um, a lot of them kind of started looking at their own or they were forced to look at their own mortality and they didn't really want to do that. Yeah. So a good amount of our friends pulled away um, from us. Um, other friends really stepped up and, you know, I cemented a lot of friendships through that. The people who were willing to drop everything and come um, and have have us be part of their lives. Um, but yeah, I mean, I had to take care of two kids and a he had a lot of like mobility issues. Um, I had a lot of like side effect issues. Um, for a while I was going to solve, uh, you know, I was going to cure the cancer. So I'm, I'm what's called an Enneagram eight. Um, <laughs> and I was going to, you know, through the sheer force of my will find a cure to cancer. So that was a learning experience. Um, I really learned how to accept help because I was a very independent person um, prior to that. And I had to learn the value um, and gift of accepting help um, and being open to help. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it really, it did flip my world upside down. Um, I had to learn how to exp like begin expressing emotions. I was somebody who, you know, Unless I got forced into a corner, I wasn't somebody who was willing to cry in front of people. So uh, I learned how to start expressing my emotions a little bit better. Um, yeah. yeah, it was just so it was just how uh, did all of that affect your faith? For some people, that's it. It destroys it. And for others, it deepens it. How did your faith experience interact with your life experience yeah um well number one the one of the things that i found very interesting was that um my husband w had never had had a lot of bad experiences with the church growing up and while he was um somebody who was supportive of my faith and like raising my kids catholic he had never really been kind of on board with it, but when he got sick, he started to be find a lot more sub, sub sustenance from faith, and so he ended up converting to Catholicism, which was was a neat experience. Um, for me, I never felt like there was times that I was angry and forlorn and hopeless and and all you know all that range of emotions and for me i felt like i my faith actually deepened and became more real during that experience so um you know i was always a good catholic so you know i always went to mass i always did the the right things i always followed the rules i always you know went through knew the prayers went through the motions did all the things but I don't know that it ever felt like real. It was very compartmentalized. So like it was a part of my life and I went to church on Sundays and I, you know, did all these things, 
but it wasn't integrated into my life and it wasn't truly real. And during that time, I actually developed a much more personal relationship with God and felt that God was very much real and present in these like very small but big to me grace-filled moments mm. so there would be times like I'd be at church and like the the talk at church while everybody was there listening to it it was for me mm. it was exactly what I needed right then in that moment and I had never had that experience before or you know when I was desperately in need of something and I wouldn't tell anybody about it but it would like appear and come to me mm -hmm. or I would I would hear a, a song or I would read a quote in a book or I would just have this feeling and and this knowledge that you know God was right there next to me walking alongside me through through it all um and it it was just very very personal that's a powerful experience mm, very personal um, and it was really sad because I started really doing a lot of thinking about what the nature of God is. How do I believe? What 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 happens to us after we die? And just started asking a lot of those big questions um, and kind of testing the limits of like, does like, am I allowed to be mad at God? Am I allowed to question these things? I'm, you know, moving beyond the platitudes and the kind of the rote things but my brother-in-law um who was also not a very not a faith-filled person um really believed that there was nothing that happens to you like after you die there's nothing that happens to you and i'm i'm still not sure what happens but i know something happens and i had a lot of like peace and and hope and um, like death to me is a, is not, um, like there's a grief involved, but it's not like a, um, a deep, dark, hopeless experience. And for him, because he thought that, you know, there was nothing like you die, that's the end. He was distraught and I could not relate to that at all because I did have a sense of like hope and love and like big picture and wholeness and create like ongoingness and um it just i just like that's always really struck with me this his sense of hopelessness and desolation because there was nothing else mm. do you find that once you develop that eyesight or that spiritual insight to experience god in those you know the mundane but ordinary everyday things that that stays with you yeah um it it actually developed in me a yearning for even more of a close personal relationship with god mm -hmm. and a yearning to continue to want to have my eyes opened up and continue to have that intentionality in my life because I had a taste of it and I wanted I wanted more and more and more of it um, so that yearning then led to exploration of different ways to connect with God and to engage with God and also I think a little bit more of a personal understanding for me that like I have I I and everybody else is so much more like plugged in and connected with God. Like I'm in God and God's in me and not this like God as at an arm's length or God mm -hmm. as a puppet master or God as a, um, an uninterested bystander. I, I, I kind of, it, it led me down a path to one, want to know how to engage that a lot more. And also to kind of really develop a different understanding of God. 
I love that. That's a huge difference in understanding. Mm -hmm. Now, that was another, I mean, I would say that was another decade that took me to kind of really even be able to put some of those things into words. Sure. One of my favorite theologians is named Marjorie Sue Hockey. And in one of her books, she's talking about the presence of God. And she likes the image of water. And she says, imagine that you're in the middle of a stream and you pick up a rock or maybe even a piece of wood, like a log, and it's wet. The water is on it. But if you cut that log in half, the water is all through it. Every pore of that log has water there, but the presence of the water doesn't make the log any less of a log. And I love that imagery that God is, or spirit, divine, however you choose to name that universal divinity, that that spirit is so omnipresent mm -hmm. that it's just all through us, and not only us, but all of creation. I think that's so beautiful, and that came to mind as you were describing your views and your understanding of that presence. Yeah, I've really, um, over the years, I've really connected with the concept of process theology, which is um, that God, like seeing God as more of a, of a verb instead of a noun, and um, like God is the happening that's happening, and um, that God is a gerund. So it's like you were saying, the God is the water that's watering, and God is the the log that's logging and all of that all at once. I love that you said process theology because Marjorie Suhaki was one of the leaders in process theology. Oh, wow. oh I'm definitely, I'm not familiar with her, so I'm going to have to to look that up. Well, I yeah, will inundate you with her books. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah, that's, that's resonates with me so, so deeply. Well, it sounds like the depths of conversations are wildly invitational at soul care. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do like being able to ask open-ended questions and see where people are and invite them to explore and um, examine examine their thoughts um and their beliefs and and even enrich them a little bit more um one of the analogies that i love a lot or metaphors i guess is um the um a lot of jewish rabbis now they're talking about scripture but a lot of jewish rabbis will look at things like it's an 88 sided diamond and that you know, there it's a beautiful thing, and you can just turn it and see a different facet of it, and it's still a beautiful thing. So I do like to be curious and provocative, and um, and ask a lot of questions and why and how did you come to that and where where does that come from and when you think that way, like how does then how does that then lead you to act and to see the world and to see other people? And yeah. Love that. Love it. But uh, gently too. Like I don't, like I said, I, I don't, I don't claim to know anything. <laughs> <laughs> You're a torchbearer. Yes, exactly. Now, Kelly, if I'm a spiritual leader in the Champaign-Urbana area and I wanted to hold a class or a workshop or a seminar, would I be able to contact you and do that at Soul Care? Yes, we have a um, we have a multi-purpose room that um, can be set up in lots of different ways. Um, there's information about renting space on my website, which is experiencesoulcare.com, um, and you can teach classes here. You can have private events here um, or workshops. I also do facilitation both on site and in the community um, and kind of can can um, adjust 
the exercises and the practices to the audience that we're working with. What a gift you have for the community. That's beautiful. And we will have the link to that website in the show notes. And I would encourage everyone to check that out. Also on the blog at the Pursuing Uncomfortable blog, it's at melissaepkin.com. Head over to the blog. There's a place for you to comment and ask questions. So whatever questions you may have for Kelly, drop them in the blog. I'll make sure that she sees them and can respond. Or if you have any other questions or comments or are curious about faith or offerings of soul care, that's a good place to put it or just check out the website. Yeah, definitely. And I'm always open for a good conversation. (laughs) Those are a gift. As are you, Kelly. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me.